beauty, the world seemed to say. Fleeting away, losing our grip, trying to keep our insanity at bay. I know I'm not okay. I know I'm not who I am right now. But I'm bowing down to the noise and the lies that I'm not holier than thou. Pulled apart, confused, it feels like my freedom is being strangled. Is there a way of escape? A way out? A way not to be entangled in this mess anymore? How do I cope? How do I move on? How do I push past this? My, My drug, drug of choice, choice I wish, I wish to, dismiss. to dismiss is... So in 1336, a little bit of a history lesson here, most of the world changed. Because at this moment, as you can see in this picture behind me, or it will come up, that um, the first public clock was brought to life in Milan, Italy. And let me tell you, it revolutionized like the Western Hemisphere. And from that point on, it spread like wildfire in like almost every city of the world. Now, you can probably notice on the tower, it doesn't really have a clock face. That's because, um, like old school times, there was a drum beat that would hit at every hour of the day. So if it was 1 a.m., it hit one time. 1 p.m., 13 times. And before 1336, the world's relationship with time was essentially the sun. The sun would come up, get ready to do your work, you do your daily things. When the sun goes down, it's kind of like around 8, 9 p.m., who knows, but we have no electricity anyways. So we're going to go home, spend time with family, rest, repeat. It's funny because at the time, this world leader said when this was brought that the clock was an act of rebellion against the sun. That we are no longer under the jurisdiction of the sun anymore, but we have now been liberated with our new relationship with the clock. If we want to have a meeting at 7 a.m., hey, let's just listen to seven drum beats, boom, and then we can meet at 7 a.m., the potential for efficiency is so much there with this newfound invention. Now fast forward to 1802 and 1806. Humphrey Davy invented the electric light, and then Thomas Edison brought forth the first light bulb into the world. Society at that point pretty much just like gave the middle finger to the clock and the sun and that, the whole system itself, pretty much saying like, hey, we don't have to work a typical nine to five job anymore because we have electricity. We can push on forward and work way into the night. Productivity and efficiency at an all time high. Fast forward to 2023. How ironic that statement has aged, hasn't it? That with the blessings of getting to work and work and work also comes with the curse and living with those side effects. In North America alone, over 86% of men and 60% of women work over 40 hours a week. We are the highest working um, group of society and also the continent with the most unused vacation days. But also, we are the continent that experiences the highest levels of stress, anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. It's not funny, but it's kind of ironic that actually when you talk to people... Um, and have an introductory conversation, the University of Connecticut concluded that approximately 91% of conversation replies usually begin with, I'm stressed or I'm busy. 91%. Like, hey, how you doing? Oh, yeah, it's busy, dude. Oh, yeah, I've just, just, been, just been stressed lately. But what's ironic about this is that before the 1920s, which is just over 100 years ago, the word stress wasn't even used as a term to describe a state of emotion. That term was simply used in physics. It's when the metal beam would be starting to break at its breaking point, and we know at that moment that beam is stressed out. And then <laughs> some physicist probably looked at it, looked at the metal beam breaking, and was thinking, wow, that's just my life right now. And who knows, it could have probably caught it wild, like wildfire. Now, according to the Barner Group, which is a leading think tank for studies, stress has been put under the umbrella of mental health issues. 
over the course of this month, as you uh, kind of heard from Abby, that we'll be addressing some, some mental health issues and attempting to give some prescriptions um, in order to keep them at bay. Now, I say this carefully because mental health is not something to joke around with or to mess with. It is an issue that's not linear. It's not a black or white issue. There are so many variables to consider here. Now, for the month, as we talk about it, I know there's no simple cure. I know there's no pill that you can take and you can wave goodbye to mental illness. Can God heal you from your mental illness? Absolutely. Does he always? No. Why? I wish I could tell you. But what I can tell you is that how we, how we order and structure our lives can be a great solution to fulfilling our place on earth with, without getting into obstacles of mental health. Meaning, what I'm trying to say here is that even though I theoretically suffer through mental health stuff, I can still live out my calling, the plan and purpose that God has given me, without fully succumbing to the obstacles and hindrances of mental health illnesses or issues in that order. So for this month, we'll be taking a look at tonight the topic of stress. Next week, I'll talk again, talk about burnout, which is a very underrated thing to talk about. So we're going to talk about and tackle it next week. And then Jeff will take us home with uh, talking about anxiety and then talking about depression. Now, although the, the topics are pretty specific, mental illness is defined as a disorder that affects your mood, your behavior, and your thinking. Examples of mental, mental illness in that umbrella includes depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and or anything that hinders someone to perform at their full cognitive state. A couple more stats for you guys just to kind of give you a holistic con a context here. Right here in Canada, in the de uh, psychology department of UBC, in 2018, it is estimated that approximately 18 to 20 percent of Canadian youth and young adults are affected by mental illness or disorder. It has grown 1 percent every year since 2007, which ironically was the first year of the introduction of the iPhone. Mental illness is increasingly threatening the lives of our generation, with Canada's youth and young adult suicide rate being the third highest in the world. In May 2017, a survey was conducted by a Harvard University and the University of Vermont, and after doing psych psychological tests amongst youth and young adults ages 14 to 24, they concluded there is, in fact, a direct correlation between social media platforms to anxiety, depression, loneliness, bullying, and fear of body image. I want to read to you a Bible story. It's found in the book of Luke, and we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, we kick off with something called the Four Gospels. It's four different books giving an illustration and perspective of Jesus' life from different vantage points. One of them is the book of Luke. And we're going to read in chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. You might be familiar with it. If not, it'll be on the screen right behind me. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, in a classic Jesus way, oh, my dear Martha, you were worried and upset about all these different details. There's only one thing to be concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, when you and I read the story, for the most part, Martha is always pinned as the villain of the story. But if Jesus wasn't in the story, if this was just an old folks' tale with no spiritual implications whatsoever, you and I would probably agree that Martha is the hero. She's been the, the actual good host here. She's the one preparing the, with the invitation. She's cooking. She's cleaning. She's preparing the place in order for the guest to feel at home. She's doing all the necessary preparations. She's doing good. But based on the ending of the story, you would think that Jesus is correcting her for doing too much. But as a matter of fact, he's not correcting her based on the business of the work she's doing. He's correcting her based on the attitude and the thinking of it. Now we'll get into this. How is the story related to stress? Well, it is a fact 
that there is a strong correlation between, in between your mind, your body, and your soul. Whether you're religious or not, whether you're Christian or not, it'd be safe to assume this and to agree with that and how all these things can be intertwined. But get this, at the root, at the root of all our stress problems is a feeling of not being in control. I'll say that again because that's super important. At the root of all our stress problems is a feeling of not being in control. That's essentially what it is. When we can't see what's happening next, can cause a well of emotions that could downward spiral our lives if we're not careful. Jesus said to Martha that she was worried and upset. Another translation, the one we just read, said, Martha, you are distracted. Now, distracted can be, can be defined as multiple things. Webster's says preoccupied, diverted, agitated. If you take the word distracted and go to the original language in the Bible, which is Greek, New Testament, it means being pulled apart. Being pulled apart. And I feel like that, that's just a state of feeling for a lot of us in this room. How are you feeling? Oh, I feel my mind is just being pulled apart. Distracted. Going in so many different directions. And that's the issue with a lot of people who are struggling through mental health stuff. Their mind is being pulled in so many different directions that everything else in their life is left uneasy. Yes, there is a physical and psychological component to mental health, but if God created us in his image, then everything in our bodies, including our minds, belong to him as well. One of the, most, one of the world's most renowned um, doctors, Dr. Caroline Leaf, Coincidentally, as a Christian, said, I've studied the brain for over 30 years. I've run my own clinic. I now travel around the world doing teachings and providing resources. But the true answer of mental health lies in the church. The answer, according to that interview, the answer is found in Jesus. And so in this story, there are some things that we can learn that will not only help us in our ordinary day-to-day lives, but really help us understand how to achieve peace which is the ultimate solution to the anxious mind. Jesus doesn't point out the outward actions that Martha is doing, but actually her attitude. And there are four different attitudes that, if you're not careful, will lead to a distracted, pulled apart in many directions type of mind, and ultimately feeling like you're losing control, which is the root of all the stress that we feel. Number one, Jesus is pointing out an attitude of manipulating. Lord, doesn't it seem unfair? Like, there's a difference between caring for a situation and controlling the situation. When you control the situation too much, it will often backfire on you since we're all human, and that happens all the time. That you will start, when you lose control, you will start to feel agitated and even further frustrated. With Martha, she's playing the scenario in her mind to control it in her mind when, well, Jesus is coming with his disciples, and so I'm going to have my pots here, my pants here, and my food here. We're going to have some snacks, olives, hummus, I don't know. And so when the scenario is not playing out in her mind, she starts to get angry at Mary for not helping, but instead she's taking it straight to Jesus what to say to her. And that's a dangerous road where you and I can soon distort the truth. When you distort the truth, it becomes lies, and eventually that's how our mind starts to fill up with things that are not true. You'll see what I mean when it comes full circle. The second point is that he's been pointing out an attitude of obligating. But now I have to. She was distracted by the big dinner that had to be prepared. You see, shifts so quickly, and notice that the word had to be made. It's now becoming... It's now become this obligation. When things in life, or generally speaking, start to become an obligation, I don't know about you, but for me, it it starts to feel like a chore, doesn't it? And that's how you start to lose passion, start to lose the enthusiasm, and start to lose your joy. I remember when I was in my third or fourth year, I was a youth pastor in Kamloops, British Columbia, and I remember that I was at a point in my life where you know, 
I'll be honest, I was just doing things easy, well. Okay, I wasn't thinking much about it, and soon or later, I wasn't being careful, so all these things just became like chores. I remember my youth night was on a Tuesday night. I would come to work on a Tuesday morning, not have youth prepared, sort of whip out a message in like half an hour, an hour, play a couple games, whatever. And it was a moment in my life and season where I was like just really up, just upset with myself because I came to a point in my life where as a Christian, as a believer, yeah, sure, I can rhyme off these prayers, but there was no heart, there was no, there was no essence, there was no passion behind it. I remember in that season in my life was one of the driest seasons I've ever lived. I hated it because I felt distant. Things became an obligation. I was talking more about God than talking to God. And after a season, my mind just starts to kind of like feel uneasy, torn, confused, lost. But long story short, you know, I had my wake-up call, and I realized that everything that God has given me in my calling, and my specific calling is to be a pastor, to work in this church for this season. Your calling may look like something else, but whatever God has given me, it has, given, has been given to me as a privilege. It has been given to me as an honor. And it's happened so quickly and naturally, but often we take these privileges and all of them switch them to obligations. And that is the entrance where the energy comes from what will make you to go from Mary, just sitting in the basket at the feet of Jesus, to a Martha. What's the difference? Mary is about an opportunity. Martha is about an obligation. Mary is about a get-to. Martha is a, a have-to. Do you see a difference there? It's a very wide end of the spectrum. But that's what I want from my life. I don't want to have to do these things every day. I get to do these things every day. I don't just go to church so I can get out of hell. I go to church because I know that Jesus loves me as a plan and a purpose for me. Don't ever feel like you have to come to the project. Like, have to. Because then you'll just end up like the stale, bitter Christian. I'll be honest. Come because you know there's a potential and an opportunity here that this place is a true refuge. That there's relationship here. That there's a Savior who wants to have a, a tangible encounter with you. See, a healthy mind is filled with thoughts to wire you to feel purposeful and joy. And when these things start to become an obligation, your mind starts to wander and open up a door to invite unhealthy thoughts and lies. Now, before we move on to the last two points, I want to take a moment, stay seated, but I do want these words to be spoken over your life. And it's through a song, so the band is here and they'll play. There's a good chance you know it already. But I want this to be a reminder of what we go through. I know we're talking about points that, you know, kind of bring stress and tension into your lives. But what I want to do is take a moment to pause and breathe and allow you to be reminded or hear for the first time possibly that you are not meant to do this life alone. And that the anxious mind and the mind that's being pulled apart in so many directions is not what God wants for you. As a matter of fact, God wants to bring you opposite. He wants to bring you peace. He wants to bring you to a wholeness again. He wants to bring healing, restoration, all these different things. So, if you're struggling with stress, whew, take a moment and just breathe. If you're struggling with tensions that's going on in your mind, for the next few moments, all I want you to do is just close your eyes and allow these words through the medium of music to be spoken over your life. The third point that Jesus notices in this, uh, in this little story here, or we notice in this story, is an attitude of, uh, of victimizing. Tell her to come and help me. The Bible says, where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. This wasn't Mary's decision. This is Martha's decision. And now she's playing victim to the very thing that she decided to do. And I know this may be a tough pill to swallow, but I think a lot of us play this card a lot. We're in the, stress, in the stressful situations, <clears throat> we're actually the culprit to put ourselves into that situation. That we, we make our bad decisions and flip it to make other people's emergencies. Jesus said, I have come to give you life, an abundant life. Meaning you were meant to soar, 
But when you develop a victim mentality, you purposefully put a crutch on yourself, and now you're, just, you're barely able to fly. And now when you can't fly, you throw around the blame around and act like you're the person who constantly needs the help and the attention when you were the, the one in the first place to feel that victim mentality based on your bad decision making. I've done that too. Feel me out. I, I, I've been there and I've done that. And when we play this out enough, it can cause a lot of stress and a lot of tension to our daily lives. But when we own our situation, when we come to a point and ask God to be in the center of our lives, it's the perfect place to start to live a healthier life, both physically and mentally. So listen to me very carefully. God has not called you to live as a victim. God has called you to victory. God has ca- not called you to, I'm sorry, God has called you to meet other people's needs. He hasn't called you to create unnecessary ones. Martha has no peace. Her mind is in complete disarray. It is stressing her out. And that is what concerns Jesus. Now finally, the last point, number four, is an attitude of interpreting. Lord, don't you care? She's making like these like inconclusive decisions. That can become dangerous for mental health because we act out our scenarios in our mind and we start to imper- interpret things to mean what we think they mean and interpret other people if they don't maybe check up on me or talk to me. If we go through situations that are hard and stressful and we start to realize our society or our friend circle or our church or our pastors and realize like, oh, that person hasn't called me, phoned me, texted me, therefore that person may not care for me. Well, this is what's happening to Martha here that she's making these conclusions, these preconceived notions of what's happening in the situation, and therefore, with the scenarios that's that's playing out in her mind, she becomes now anxious and frustrated. Today, with, with schools, with social media platforms, we really can start to distort what reality would feel like to fit our specific thinking. I know it sounds like juvenile, and I've dealt with this a lot with, with, our, with our teenagers when I was a youth pastor, and uh, I realized it's the same with young adults, that even on Instagram, when certain people don't follow certain people, or if you don't get tagged, or you see pictures with people and you're not there with them, and all of a sudden you're now starting to create this dramatic scenario in your mind, and now you're kind of having some preconceived notions and drawing conclusions that are not really fact. And then when all these things come to play, oh boy, peace is just out the window. You start to manipulate the situation, and you start to think these things, and now your, your life seems unfair, and you start to play the victim mentality, and you start to throw this kind of tamper tantrum all over the place. Hear me out. This happens all the time. When these things happen, when we start to play scenarios in our minds that can legitimately cause stress, There's good stress, there's bad stress. But no matter what happens by the end of the day, you are not a bad person. You are loved. You are forgiven. And maybe at this point, we need to stop taking lessons from Martha and now start to take lessons from Mary. And maybe now we need to learn to sit down. We need to learn to sit down. Life is not making you crazy. Life isn't out to get you. It's the lies that you and I put in our minds. It says in verse 40, Lord, don't you care? She interprets the fact that he has not done what she wants him to do as a sign that he does not care for her. Wow. That is nothing further from the truth. Jesus is saying, Martha, I care about you more than you care about you right now. And that's why I wish that you'd just be here with me. Not being stressed out in the kitchen, but just be with me. Now for me, Reuben, in my life, God wants me to give. I know that in my calling, my purpose in life, God wants me to give, but I cannot give if I'm not filled first. And if I'm not filled first, then I'll just be running on empty. And if I'm running on empty for so too long, that's when crap hits the fan. I know it. I've taken inventory and recollection of my life. That in the moments and the seasons where I am not close with God, where I am not putting priorities, sitting at the feet of Jesus, I feel torn. I feel distracted. I feel pulled apart. I become needy. 
I'm sick. I'm quick to complain. I get angry. I get frustrated about my scenario, my job, my coworkers, my whatever may happen in the moment. And I start to complain. And now all of a sudden I find myself living in my own divided life. When we start to think like this, not too long after, it will become a reality. School's hard, I know. Friendships are hard, I know. Work's hard. Living with some families is hard. But the way that we reach out as Christ followers to those situations will determine if we're mentally living at peace or if we're living mentally not at peace. See, get that the biggest danger a person, I'll take this even further, a Christian can be is not the doubting person. It's not the person that's skeptical about the faith. It's the one living in the lie that God does not care about us. And in order to live for him, we have to perform for him. To Jesus at the end of the story, as I'm just finishing off tonight, Jesus at the end of the story drops one of the biggest bombs, theoretically, in his whole ministry life. The one thing you need to know, Martha, is one thing. If there's anything else that we can take from Jesus' life or reading about him in the Bible, it's one thing. Know this. Mary has found it. And it will not be taken away from her. One of the biggest things Jesus can say, he could have said it in front of crowds, so many people, including the Sermon on the Mount, but no, he intentionally addresses this truth bomb to two sisters in the living room. And when I, and when I feel when, I, when I'm reading this story, and when you research it more, there's so much intentionality of him wanting to connect to the individual. Because there's so many things that Jesus can say and preach to the crowds, and it'll be awesome. We could take that to the bank. But the one thing that he wants us to know deep and down our soul, he wants to tell you individually. It's one thing to be concerned about. Mary found it. What did Mary do? All she did was just sit and do nothing. Exactly. Just sit at the feet of Jesus. I know it might sound a little too juvenile or simple, but essentially the, 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 the story of this message is the solution to stress is sitting with our Savior. The solution to stress is sitting with our Savior. When we're simply putting priority with just being with Jesus, a whole lot of things can happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I, meant, I mentioned this at the beginning of the message, that mental health cannot be solved with a pill. It's not an A plus B equals C scenario. There is power in the name of Jesus, yes. There's also power in the things that he's intertwined with. So, maybe, just maybe, you need to stop looking at Instagram and TikTok when the first thing you wake up. Maybe. Maybe you need to eat a meal with people face-to-face -face once in a while. Maybe you need to go outside for a walk, just get some fresh air in the middle of your studying. Maybe. And maybe you need to sit down and read God's Word, read the Bible, and listen to some worship tunes. All these things, it's like I mentioned before, the physical, the mental, the, the, the emotional, they're all intertwined. They're all connected. All these things factored in can indeed lead you into a less stressful life. Why? Because the times where you feel like you're not in control, all these practical steps will point you to the one who is always in control. With, will all your problems go away? No, probably not. But can you have problems in your life and still live with peace? Yes. The solution to stress is simply just sitting with our Savior. And so, I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now. And I'll have to pray over you. And I'm going to invite you to sing along with some, with, some, with some songs here. And if you're new to church, hey, you can just kind of watch. If you call the project home, like, let's capitalize on this moment. Because our Savior is here. Jesus is here. And it's a beautiful moment for you and I just to bask in his presence as we engage in these songs together. So let's pray. 
and I'll leave it up to the band. Thank you, Jesus, for our time together. We pray, Lord, that um, whatever we've been taught tonight would not just go in one ear and out the other, but it would be truly applied and practiced in our lives. May we take inventory of our, of our, of our soul and our life. May we switch some things here and there God, would you reveal some things that maybe are, are, are consuming our thought patterns, our attention, and may we be bold enough and courageous enough to kind of put that aside so you can be replaced as the, as the main priority. Whatever that is, Lord, would you kind of just bring it to our minds right now? And as we sing, may we praise, may we respond, may we thank you for the things that you have done. And Lord, we know that even in the midst of a stressful life, we can still live with peace, we can still live with a purpose and a plan. So God, we honor you and thank you. We love you and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.